Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ERS uh, YouTube video uh, channel and to the ERS recordings of the presentations given at our London meeting in 2018. I do hope you enjoy these uh, recordings which are a summary uh, of the uh, highlights of the uh, meeting uh, in London uh, and I think this bears testament to the hard work that uh, was undertaken by all members of the uh, society. Uh, I do hope you enjoy the, uh, the videos in, in their current format. Thank you very much, Valerie. It is a real pleasure and honor to stand here on this marvelous day and me too want to congratulate the people who worked so hard to get this all done. And I want to especially mention Claire Hopkins for the enormous amount of work she did. And I'm happy she's still here, all alive after all she has been through. But it will be a marvelous meeting and I'm really looking forward to it. It's always very difficult to look into the future and um, I'm not very good at it, I think, but I will try to put the data from the last few years and, uh, together and look with you at some new developments and where I ex expect we will be in five to ten years, hopefully. And this slide shows what we all want to achieve. We want to prevent disease, we want better diagnostics, and eventually better treatment for our patients. And the things that have really um, changed in the last few years, I put in these five circles, which will be the basis of this talk. We definitely made big steps in understanding pathophysiology. We learned the possibility, or we started to understand a little bit the possibility of big data and how it will help us in uh, the three goals we want to achieve. For that, we need network analysis, and that will really change our lives because it's very, very complicated. Um, we learned that not only randomized controlled trials can help us in our patient care, but also real life data can point us to new areas to do research. And very important, and of course nothing new, but on the other hand, so very new because of all the new possibilities is the particip participation of patients in our daily work. When we talk about rhinology, of course, it's not only rhinitis and rhinosinusitis, but we also talk about sleep medicine, facial plastics, uh, olfaction, um, and uh, tumor surgery. But today, I want to uh, emphasize most of my talk on this middle area, rhinitis and rhinosinusitis. And of course, all these different aspects of our profession have very close relationships and we can't look at one without also looking at everything around it. So let's first look a little bit about prevention because very often that's part of uh, our, t our tasks that we forget that actually uh, the best doctor is the doctor that is not needed. And you probably know that in China for a long time GPs were paid for keeping patients healthy. You weren't paid for the diseased patients. It was your mistake. You had to keep them healthy. So prevention is a very important part also of our profession. And of course, we have different forms of prevention, but this is the one which is most difficult for us to do something about. It's the primary prevention of disease. And it has a, a, a very different aspects. It's the air we breathe, but also the things we eat or put in our mouth in another way. This was 
a moment nobody will forget in time. 9, uh, 9 September 2011, and the massive amount of air pollution and the disaster uh, for the people who died there, but also disaster for the people who helped to prevent people from dying there. For example, these fire workers and see how they, what an enormous amount of pollution they had. If we look at these people 10 years later, this is what happened. You see here patients with, uh, or we have patients now, with uh, um, fire workers who had a very high exposition, who were there very early, the middle group and the people who arrived a week later. And look at the difference in chronic line sinusitis. Of the group that arrived there early, 50% of these people now have chronic rhinus sinusitis. So that's a very clear indication of the role of air pollution in chronic rhinus sinusitis. And something I think in the next 10 years, we as rhinologists have to take much more seriously and have to work to uh, get to the public and um, the government that this is an issue that causes not only lower airway, airway disease, but definitely also upper airway disease. Then another field we very often forget, and this is a study from uh, Peter Hellings, already a little bit older, but still very relevant, is the role of occupation. How often do you ask your patients after sinus surgery, what's your work? What is your occupational load? This study shows that patients were divided in the number of times they had surgery, from never to more than three times. And here you see the occupational exposure, and there's a direct correlation. So occupational exposure is an extremely important part of uh, rhinus sinusitis that I think many of us often forget to ask about, and definitely to do something about. And not always that's so easy but at least we have to be aware and ask. And then something we can do something about, and very often, at least for me, you become a little bit um, demotivated to start to talk about it again. But here are the data. Smoking has an enormous effect on chronic rhinus sinusitis. And after correction for a number of factors, Smoking gives twice as much chronic rhinus sinusitis as not smoking. How often do you bother to really try to help a patient? Not just say, you know you shouldn't smoke, but really say, how can I help you to stop smoking? So something we really have to try, I think, in the next years, to take this whole aspect of prevention from global things that are very difficult to manage, like air pollution, to things in our uh, daily practice, like occupation and smoking, and talk about it with our patients. After primary prevention, most of the patients we see are beyond that. You can't primary prevent. We have to work on secondary and tertiary prevention and try to let them live with the disease as good as they can. And for that, um, it's very important that we really understand what the disease is like. And in that case, in th that aspect, we really made a lot of progress in the last few years. And I want to mention especially Klaus Bachert, who pulled many of these studies and uh, brought a lot of new knowledge. This was chronic rhinus sinusitis 10 years ago, with or without polyps, that was about it. We understood that there were many other forms, patients with fungal disease, cystic fibrosis. We learned from uh, lots of Klaus work that polyps in Asia are totally different from polyps in Europe or the US. They are neutrophilic, not eosinophilic, so we understood that you can have polyps with a very different forms of inflammation. And in the last years, we learned that there are many different endotypes, different forms of inflammation, all leading 
to very often phenotypes that we cannot discriminate at the moment. And this is a part of the Galen study we did together in Europe, and Klaus was leading that, um, looking at different endotypes in a cluster analysis. So we didn't in advance decide what we were going to analyze, but we put a lot of factors in a model that we thought would be relevant and interesting. And of course, the question is always whether we put all the factors in that are relevant and interesting. But in that group, looked at the different forms of inflammation. And what you can see here is that there are groups with very low IL-5, an inflammatory uh, a cytokine, very important in the eosinophilic inflammation, and positive for IL-5 patients with high IgE, very high IgE, patients with no IgE at all. And if we try to correlate that with phenotypes, you see that the patient with and these were European patients, so we have to realize that. But in Europe, patients with high IL-5 usually have polyps, and with high IL-5 and IgE usually have asthma. You hear me say usually, and that's a, a very intriguing part. You can also see that even in the group with no IL-5, and for example, IL-17, IL-22 inflammation, there's still a significant part that has polyps. So it's not a division in one or two, but it's a very difficult mix of different diseases. And in the next 10 years, I'm sure that we will start to better understand all these different uh, endotypes and be able to treat our, um, to, f to focus our treatment to that different endotypes. Another important um, thing we much better realized in the last decade is the importance of the epithelial cell. And um, we performed a lot of work on that. This is done by uh, Peter Halling's group. Um, and sh w uh, a lot of groups have shown that epithelial cell is not just a barrier that is there to keep things out, just like your skin, but it's actually a very active part of our immune system. The epithelium is the first that encounters the things that come into our nose, and it's not there just to keep it out, but it's there to react and to call upon the immunological system. And the epithelium produces a large number of cytokines. And you don't have to remember all these names, but just remember for two minutes, IL-25. Uh, after that, you can forget it. <laughs> Why? Because another thing we found out in the last years is that there is a whole new group of lymphocytes called innate lymphocyte cells. And why are these important? Because they finally brought us the link to understand why in the innate immune system, why we can have a Th2-like inflammation in a situation where there is no allergen. And here again you see that IL-25, because these cells are stimulated by these epithelial factors to result into a Th2 inflammation. And now, Quite recently, this study showed that IL-25, if you block it, and it's still in mice, but it will be in us in the near future, hopefully, um, that if we block that IL-25, polyps do not occur, or now Th2 inflammation does not occur in mice. But mice are there for us to become men. So let's look a little bit of, of what big data has brought us in the recent years. And to understand big data, we have to stand, understand all the factors that influence the diseases we're interested in, like rhinosinusitis and rhinitis. There is um, the environment, 
the metabolome, the genome, transcriptome, microbiome, epigenome, so a number of factors that all interact, and that's why it's so complicated and so difficult to understand, and why we need this big data to better understand the disease. And this is a study, or well, a review from the group of Richard Douglas, explaining all the different words you probably never heard of, but will have to understand in the next future about how to uh, analyze all these big data and try to understand supervised classification or co-occurrence network interference, whether you like it or not, it will be part of our future life. Let's go back to uh, things a little bit easier to understand. This is an example uh, of uh, Fleur Hansen, one of my co-workers, and uh, the group of uh, Jean-Michel Closec. We both looked in big databases what the occurrence was of complications of, of acute rhinosinusitis. And why was that interesting? Because if you look at the amount of antibiotics used in France compared to the Netherlands, for acute rhinosinusitis, there is a massive difference. I think French people use five times more antibiotics for a, a perceived acute rhinosinusitis than Dutch patients. Well, if antibiotics would work to prevent uh, complications of acute rhinosinusitis, you would expect that in France there are uh, far less uh, uh, complications than in the Netherlands. And here you see the two studies. In France, it was an estimated population of um, 12 million people in that da database of hospitals around uh, Poitiers. In the Netherlands, the adult population of the Netherlands is about 12 million too, and that were the two uh, populations uh, evaluated. So in the Netherlands, we have a a national database of all patients going into hospital, which was actually um, started by my father uh, 30 years ago. In France, there were 30 complications of acute rhinosinusitis in that year, 11 intracranial. In the Netherlands, there were 22, 11 intracranial. 37% um, of the patients came into hospital without any signs of acute rhinosinusitis before the complication. So the complication was the first uh, sign of, that something was wrong. 37% in France, 40% in the Netherlands. The same amount of patients have had antibiotics. So all these together points to antibiotics do not help to prevent uh, serious complications of acute rhinosinusitis. And I hope in the future it will lead that we are not going to use antibiotics anymore. Another example, this is work from uh, Claire and Valerie, uh, looking at the big database they have here, the national audit in the UK on chronic rhinosinusitis. And very interesting things can be seen here. This is a uh, evaluation where they divided the patient into three groups. A, a, a group that was uh, operated early after the diagnosis of disease, in the first year after the diagnosis, a group that was operated between one and five years, and a group that was, was operated after five years after they had the diagnosis of chronic rhinosinusitis, and see what happens. Here is the effect on the SNOT22 in a period of five years after the surgery. You see the early cohort um, didn't have, so, um, sorry, had the la largest change and the late, the late cohort hardly had, uh, actually came, uh, became worse after the treatment. Then they looked at 
uh, whether later surgery had impact on um, the amount of healthcare needs. And here you see comparing of the early cohort and then they divided the cohort in patients without asthma and with asthma. But you see in both groups, the patients that were um, operated late, so compare this one with that one and that one with that one, had a, a, a much higher use of healthcare. This is patient uh, visits to the doctor and this is the uh, amount of prescriptions used than the patients that were operated early. So nobody realized until then, at least I didn't realize, that it was important when to operate a patient. I always thought the later you operate the patient, the better. As long as they do quite well on medication, let it be. But this was a clear sign that that is a factor, and we could only find that because it was such a large cohort. And this is a study from uh, the group of uh, Luke Rutmik in Canada. Really interesting. He looked in a big Canadian database of GPs uh, how much intranasal steroids patients with chronic rhinosinusitis used. And he found that only 20% of the patients actually uh, got their prescription for chronic rhinosinusitis. And even if they got their prescription, they used it for less than three months a year. So how many of your patients do you think actually use the prescriptions that you give them? probably less than you hope. So this brought us to, of course, we know that compliance is an issue, but I didn't realize it was this massive. What is very important uh, in that study, and there was actually, it was uh, uh, pu published in um, uh, Yama Autolengold, he had a neck surgery, and there was a comment coming in a few months later saying, well, you know, how sure are you that these GPs that tick the box chronic rhinosinus actually know that the patient had chronic rhinosinusitis? And these patients probably have a totally different chronic rhinosinusitis than uh, the patients we see in our daily practice. And for that reason, the last years, um, we spent some time, and uh, that was done under uh, the lead of uh, Claire Hopkins, to find a set of outcome measures in chronic rhinosinusitis. And this is the set, it's published in Rhinology. And I would like to call upon everybody in this hall that does studies in chronic rhinosinusitis to look at this paper and to use this outcome set. Uh, it will be on the Rhinology website. It's free to have a look at the paper. It will be on the ERS website. But to start to use this set of outcome measures whenever you do research, because that will help us enormously in the next decade to be able to combine studies into big data and to really understand where uh, to analyze that data in a, in a broader fashion. So we talked about big data, but the ones who can really help us in the next decade to, to get that big data are our patients. And patient involvement will be a very important part of our daily work. And the new, uh, Pietro already uh, alluded on all the possibilities we now have with uh, the Facebook that's out, the Snapchat, uh, the apps. And for that reason, in the last few years, uh, some apps have been built, especially for patients with uh, allergic rhinitis and for chronic rhinosinusitis. And this is the one uh, for allergic rhinitis. Um, take your phone out. Today it's allowed. Yesterday it wasn't, but now it's allowed. Uh, type in allergy diary or whatever it is in your language because it is now available in 16 different languages. Play with it a little bit and use it when you see your patients. Patients can uh, indicate here how much 
problem of the disease they had very easy with the visual analog scale and uh, send that data to you uh, and discuss the data with you or with their GP whether they are controlled and it's very easy if it's over five uh, if you have on a scale from zero to ten if you have symptoms of more than five it's not good you're not controlled, you need more medication, you need other medication. If it's under five, it's either okay-ish or great. So easy ways to measure data of patients. And what can come out of it? Well, here you see um, a publication from Jean Bousquet based on this data where he compared the uh, global Visual analog score, so he just asked the patient, we just asked patients, how are you doing? How is your rhinitis today? And only asked for nasal symptoms. And you see that there is a very clear correlation, so that the nose is the part that drives the disease, not the eyes or the general symptoms. And if you then compare um, the um, amount of symptoms, so here you have uh, troublesome symptoms, nasal obstruction, ocular symptoms, you see that that has a significant impact on work, on daily activities, and on sleep. The more severe the symptoms, the more symptoms in total, the more effect on work and daily activities. Why is that important? Of course, for, for here I'm preaching for the converted. We all know that rhinitis has significant impact on, on work and daily activities. But if I go to my government and say rhinitis is a serious disease, they start to laugh. You say, well, you know, I have a snotty nose once in a while and I go to my work. Where are you talking about? So we need these data to convince the population and um, governments of the impact of disease on uh, the uh, quality of life, but especially work productivity, because that's an important um, parameter to get people interested in a disease. Um, under guidance of uh, Peter Hallings, we developed this rhinosinusitis app um, that is called My Sinusitis Coach. Again, download it on your computer. It's for Apple and Android, and it's now available in three languages, in the UK, in Belgium, in Netherlands, but we're going, going to build that out in the next few years to a very powerful tool to communicate with our patients. Again, they can fill in their symptoms, uh, but also it is a educational platform. We collected questions from a large group of um, G uh, uh, ENT surgeons first, asked them, send us a list of your top 20 questions that you hear in your practice every day. Then we had um, uh, talks with patients in uh, five different countries we had meetings with patients and discussed all these questions and what they thought was most important. Then we answered all these questions and put them in this app. So it's very helpful app to have to give to your patient and, and it can save you a lot of time if they find all their answers there instead of asking the questions to you. And I'm sure an educated patient is a better patient. Finally, if patients have filled in uh, their data, they can come back to you and give you give their phone, uh, give a, a QR code on their phone, and you can see how they were doing in the last month uh, on your PC. Uh, very important because I don't know how your patients are, but my patients always say, "Oh, I'm fine." And then I say, well, actually, you sent me an email two months ago that you weren't that well and actually had an asthma exacerbation and needed uh, uh, weeks of prednisolone and antibiotics. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally forgot. So this will help to get a better impression of the control of our patients. So to summarize this part, uh, potential benefits of health apps are 
enormous for different stakeholders, not only for the patient, but definitely also for us. I showed you some data how research will get an enormous boost by all these data coming in. Um, the healthcare system will help because it will be eventually cost saving and the society will benefit because if we can point to things like uh, lost work productivity, uh, we can potentially re reduce the cost of the disease for society. Let's look, at, let's look a little bit at better treatment at the end. I want to point your, I only have two slides on olfaction, but I didn't want to leave them out because I think olfaction is so important. And I want to point you to this position paper that has recently been published in Rhinology and is really a gem. It's fantastically uh, well de described everything you want to know about olfaction. And I want to point your attention to this because I really often notice that patient, that uh, uh, colleagues just didn't realize that it is possible. The possibilities of olfactory training. How many of you use olfactory training in their daily practice? 20% uh, of this whole, probably 30 if, we, if I'm lucky. So for the other 70%, patients with post-viral or traumatic or other ways of olfactory loss, you can help them. And you can help them very, very easy by giving them four smells. And you can buy these pots, but you can also tell the patient to make it himself rose, eucalyptus, lemon, gloves, things is almost available in every kitchen. And every day, if three times a day, you train yourself with smelling these smells, the uh, olfaction significantly improves compared to pe people who do not do that. So please start to use that in your daily work. Then a little bit more about treating patients. We all, I hope you all know this figure from EPOS 2012, where we, based on patients with uh, polyps, said, well, surgery or medication. And you can choose because we do not know what is best. Uh, and surgery and medication is quite broad, you know. Choose something. Uh, in the last years, we had um, uh, papers finding out when to operate patients, I will go a little bit faster because I see I run out of time, to predict uh, revision surgery, but most important, I want to point to, um, um, the, to two studies that are going on and that I hope that we can report in a few years. Um, a few years ago, Joe Rimmer, Claire, and um, uh, Chong and me did uh, a Cochrane on the best treatment, and we said you can't say whether surgery or medical treatment is the best. And now there are two studies running, one in the Netherlands and one in the UK, to try to answer that question, whether it is better or better for the patient or more cost-effective to give medical treatment or surgery. Then finally, I want to point your, your attention to, uh, again, to the endotypes. Why is that so important? Because there will be new medication. And if we're very unlucky, there won't be any surgery for polyps anymore in 10 years. I'm very sorry to bring that bad news for you, but it might be true. Because look at these new data. Again, from Klaus, or organized by Klaus, uh, a, tr a study looking at dupilumab, which is the anti owl 4 receptor, just as effective as systemic steroids, but no side effect. And the same for anti owl 5 mepolizumab, already on the market for severe asthma, but in a few years there will be no pat uh, patent on the medication anymore and there will be other companies who make me too's that do not cost 10,000 euro a year, but probably 2,000 euro a year. And then you're going to prescribe that instead of doing the next surgery. What do we need for that? 
is that we understand to which patient we have to get, give the medication. And that's still quite difficult. At the moment, it's trial and error. Some patients do wonderful on anti-IgE, other patients do wonderful on anti-IL-5, but we do not have biomarkers to predict that. And that's something we have to work on in the next years and something that I hope we can report in the next years. Because if all these different endotypes will not need the same treatment. So the treatment will be very much uh, different for different patients. And one first example of the potential to predict how patients will react is this bitter taste receptor, which uh, was uh, is extensively uh, studied by Noam Cohen in the US. And they now showed that the patients who are non-tasters, so who cannot taste bitter, uh, have much more colonizing pathogens in their sinuses than the patients who do not. So in the future, we all have taste trips with bitter taste in our clinic and will, in that way, predict the effect on chronic rhinosinusitis, maybe. So guidelines have changed from opinion-based in the last two decades of the last century, uh, the uh, experts who knew what was best to the area, the last 20 years of evidence-based medicine where we felt randomized controlled trials were the golden grail uh, and were absolutely most important to now position medicine where personalized care, prediction of success, prevention, and patient participation will lead to much more focused treatment to an individual patient instead of to whole groups of patients. I'm going to skip this. It's a pity, but I haven't pointed it right. And go to the end and say, this is a dream. And I showed this picture four years ago in Amsterdam, and I show it again, and unfortunately, it's still a dream, but it is a dream that will come through. In the next decade, I'm absolutely sure that we will have simple biomarkers that lead us to targeted treatment to a certain patient. And not the same treatment for anybody, not surgery, prednisone, let's try what's best, but treatment especially for that patient. Finally, I would like for all the people younger than 35 in the room, and I'm sure there are many uh, adv advertised ERS, I hope it's not necessary anymore, and that everybody here is a junior member of the IRS, uh, uh, ERS, but if you're not, please go to the stand in the hall and become member and uh, I want to call upon all the juniors who now benefit from this free membership for the last 10 years. Stay member also when you have to pay that 100 euro because we really need you as active members of this society. Thank you very much. <laughs>